I read a strange statement the other day. Someone saying that the greatest idea in human history was Darwin's idea of evolution to this struggle of the fittest, struggle for survival. I always thought that the Buddha's Four Noble Truths were the greatest idea. Because they point to something really different. We want to survive, not just for the sake of survival, but for the sake of happiness. You see this in people who sacrifice their lives for the sake of something that feels noble, and it makes them happy that they have made that sacrifice. There are also people who don't want to live. They look at life and they see no opportunities for happiness at all. They don't care about the body at that point. So the mind's greatest drive is for happiness. And we latch on to the body because we think it'll be a good vehicle for happiness. And the Buddha doesn't deny that. After all, he tells you to focus on the breath, he tells you to do walking meditation. You use the body. But the problem is that we have different ideas about the kind of happiness that the body can provide for us. And that's what we've got to watch out for. This is where we have to have the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. Reflection on the fact that the body is subject to aging, illness, death. We have to regard it as a tool, and a tool that we can use only for a certain amount of time before it begins to wear out. So we want to make sure that we don't get fascinated with the tool for its own sake. We train the body as part of our training in virtue. In other words, we make sure that we don't use the body to kill, or steal, or have illicit sex, or to lie, or to take intoxicants. We use it in our training and concentration as we focus on the breath, and as we focus on the movement of the body as it goes through the day, using the body as our place to be grounded. And then finally, we use it for the sake of discernment. Because it teaches us, if we listen to it, the time takes things away. When we're young and we see the body growing, getting stronger, getting more capable, even though we see old people around us, we tend to think, well, it's only going to go in the direction we want it to, i.e., getting better and better. And then gradually it turns around. Where you once were strong, you become weak. Where you once were healthy, you begin to develop illnesses. And the body that you've known as a body that's alive turns into a body that's no longer alive. And you want to make sure that you're not attached to it. I think I've told you the story about a John Fu and going around the, what he called the body shops at Wamakut in Bangkok, where he taught. He was on a Saturday evening. Saturday would be the day that people would come in the middle of the day to practice meditation with him. So on Saturday evening there were very few people, so he'd go out and get some exercise, walk around. He came back one evening and said, you know, the number of people who die and hang around their bodies is really large. And you wonder what he saw. And you, would you want to be that kind of person? who dies and doesn't have any idea of where to go, has, doesn't have any sense of yourself being apart from the body. So you just hang around. In Thailand, that's one of the reasons they cremate bodies, just to make sure that the spirit doesn't have anything to hang around anymore. But it shows that a lot of people have no sense of any independent part of the mind that doesn't have to depend on the body. Any kind of happiness that doesn't have to depend on the body. Even though the Buddha stated many times the ultimate happiness is something that's totally divorced from the body. And he shows how we use the body in order to get there. That's that fifth contemplation that we chanted just now. I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions. Whatever I do for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. You fall heir to your actions, not to the body. 
So you want to make sure you use the body and your mind to act in ways that are going to be skillful, that will lead to happiness. This is where happiness lies, in the training of the mind. So this is what you want to make sure survives. The Buddha talks about five kinds of loss. There's loss of health, loss of wealth, loss of your relatives, loss of virtue, and loss of right view. As he points out, you can survive perfectly well. Your happiness can survive perfectly well, even when you lose your health, lose your wealth, lose your relatives. But your hopes for true happiness will not survive if you lose your virtue and you lose your right view. So those are the kind of things you want to hold on to. So view the body as something that can be let go, something that you're going to use. But you want to use it in the proper way. And if you're going to struggle for survival, struggle for the survival of your virtue, struggle for the survival of right view. Because you do have the choice. As the Buddha said, if you believe that everything that you're going to experience is shaped by past actions, you're left adrift. You're bewildered and left without a protection. Because you have no guidance in thinking that one course of action would be better than another course of action, or even that you had the right to choose. Just whatever impulse comes into the mind, you just go for it. And in that way your goodness dies. You have to work on the, on the assumption, the working hypothesis, that you do have choices. And your choices are really going to matter. So this is where you focus your attention the things that you choose to do and say and think, and particularly to train the mind through meditation. We use the breath as a way of anchoring our attention in the present moment so that we can observe the mind. And we work with the breath, both because it provides us with a comfortable place to stay as we're watching the mind, and because the breath is the part of the body that's most intimately connected with the mind. When greed, aversion, delusion start in the mind, they're reflected in the way you breathe. And as you focus on the breath, you'll see yourself using perceptions to stay with the breath, direct a thought and evaluation to stay with the breath. This sensitizes you to these processes in the mind. There are a lot of Tibetan teachers who say, why focus on the breath? Because at death the breath is going to leave you, and at the moment where you really need your topic of meditation, it's going to abandon you. Well, that would be true if the breath were the only topic of meditation that's used in focusing on the breath. But remember, the Buddha has this focus on ways of breathing that make us sensitive to how the mind fabricates its experience through its perceptions, through its feelings. And even in the way the instructions for breath meditation are given, through the way you talk to yourself. And it's becoming sensitized to these things. It's really going to make a difference. And these are the things you're going to be holding on to. These are the things that are going to be giving you guidance when, you comes, when it comes to the point where you have to let the body go. You learn how to hold perceptions in mind that are going to be useful for keeping the mind focused, to keep it discerning about what can be held on to and what has to be abandoned. And you've learned how to talk to yourself, because at that point lots of different cravings are going to pull the mind in lots of different directions. And you want to remind yourself, okay, the dangerous forms of craving are the ones that deal with sensuality, becoming, non-becoming. In other words, getting fascinated with sensual pleasures or wanting to take on an identity. You see that you're losing the body and you're afraid, well, I don't have a body. Where am I going to be? What's going to become of me? 
or sometimes there's so much pain leading up to death, both physical and mental, that you just decide, well, I'd rather be snuffed out and be done with it all. And all those kinds of craving are going to come into the mind. You have to learn how to talk to yourself so you don't fall for them. Because again, you want your happiness to survive. And these are the things that are going to drag you down. So we are not so much for the survival of the body as we are for the survival of our happiness, the thriving of our happiness. So when you want to take that issue seriously, you would think that people would be serious about their happiness. In other words, that they would be careful and observant and try to be discerning about how they look for happiness. But so few people are. Some whim comes to the mind. I just follow their whim. Some brief perception strikes their fancy. I had a friend from childhood who encountered some wealthy people when he was young. And he was always struck, he was always attracted to that wealthy lifestyle, even though he never earned enough money to live that way. He tried living that way. Ended up in a lot of debt, just because of this perception that took hold of his mind when he was a child. This is a case of people looking for happiness, but not really being serious about it. If you're really serious, you try to be systematic, you try to think it through, observe who out there really is happy. And when they describe their happiness, whose explanations make the most sense? You have to say that the best candidates are the Buddha and the Arahants. So this is why we listen to them. This is why we bow down to open our hearts to their teachings, because we have so many other impulses that go pull our desire for happiness in other ways. So get serious about being happy. Be willing to do what is needed. Be willing to sacrifice what has to be sacrificed. And you find that that kind of survival really is worth struggling for, because you're not involved in struggling against other people. You're struggling against your own defilements. And the victory over your defilements is the best kind of victory there is. You're not creating karma with other people. In fact, your victory is going to be good for other people as well.